Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show, the podcast connecting coaching baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. Thank you for joining us today, episode 62, as we get into this thing, talking about athletes scouting and preparation. That'll be a lot of fun. I saw I'll tweet this week, too. I want to bring up something very similar to what we're talking about today. So let me bring in my friend and co-host, softball national champion at the University of Alabama and current day renowned coach, Cassie Riley Bosha. I did a um, concentration group, by the way, this week. Oh, nice. I almost don't want to know what your high time is, my, my or best time, because mine was, I'll just say, mine was 9.37. Not very Well, it's, it, like I said, it's relative. It's it's okay. a marking tool for you personally, <laughs> and then you go you go from there. I did chop off a minute on my walk last week. Oh, nice! That that was that's right. That was the personal record that you're trying to beat. I did not beat my personal concentration grid record this week. What was your what is your personal concentration grid record? It was it was like five fifty or what was it last week? It was it's usually right around six, and I think I got it right around five something something like that. So okay, so when athletes I start out, don't six- try to get. Don't try to get five. Don't try to get five minutes. But you I know, know what to shoot for now. Some people, it's so funny. It's very interesting to learn because, like, I'll give it to some athletes and they can cruise through it in three minutes. And it's like, yeah. they just, I don't know. It's just interesting. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a cool tool. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I always wonder, I always kind of wonder and worry, like, when I'm doing my walk, for example, I thought about this last week when I was walking. It's like, if I get a high time this week or I keep chopping off a minute every week, it's going to come to a point where I it's almost like impossible to mm. to beat that time. So then I have to re have to I guess reassess and reevaluate how to redo the walk. And that's what athlete athletes I think fear sometimes when they're mm. you know, when they're lifting weights. They might hit that plateau and might not be able to break it, or might be impossible to break. Right, and I then just, it's you know I was just going to say sorry, but looking into why you're doing it, what the goal is, and how you can take segments of it you know it doesn't have to be yeah. the same the same max every time you know yeah episode six like i don't know if i'm ever going like okay <laughs> if i hit say 120 dumbbells you know on either side dumbbell bench press I'm, i don't think i'm gonna i don't think i'm ever gonna get by that no, well I'm right then you try to do more at that weight or you move if you're an athlete you're now you go you know you move down you move it faster yeah you just change yeah. up the goal i guess <laughs> yeah you know by the way um the way athletes lift, I think that there is a form of progressive overload that athletes do. I know some trainers out there aren't for doing progressive overload with their athletes. But the one I'm doing something recently now in the gym. It's called I got this from Jason Brown. He's a renowned trainer. Um, one of the trainers I really like. I also like Joe DeFranco as well. But mm. um and and both of them have talked about this method. It's the six twelve twenty five method. Have you ever heard of this? Not the six, six, twelve, twelve five. twenty. Mm-hmm. It's 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 great. So first exercise, say you're doing a quad emphasis, right? The first exercise should be like a power move, so a box squat, right? You do six reps heavy box squat, and then you do twelve reps of another exercise that targets the quads but supports the box squat, a power exercise, and then the twenty fifth, there are the twenty five reps. You do I I did like a uh, I don't remember what what I did, but uh, Oh, I did like an eleva- feet elevated squat. Mm, feet elevated. At lighter at lighter weight, let's say. At lighter weight. Yeah. yeah. And it's a great method. And I feel great. Body feels great. Not that it, it felt bad before, but um, I, it just makes it, it feels really, really good. And it really gives you a good workout. So a- a- athletes out there who are listening to this, I do suggest you look into that. Older athletes, certainly. 6'12", 25". All right, episode 62. We're talking today athlete scouting and preparation. And first, before we get into our main topic of what this is, athlete scouting and preparation, I do want to know, because they've changed over the years, and certainly they're different with baseball and softball scouting reports. What were your scouting reports like when you were at the University of Alabama? Because they're certainly different from baseball. Yeah, it, I'll, well, I'll tell you what, it was definitely... Um hitters got something very different than pitchers and catchers, right? So how you scout the opposing offense versus how you uh, scout the pitchers is is different. Um, certainly, I think one of the biggest differences for softball is we had a prep for maybe two or three pitchers that we had to know about, whereas with baseball, um, there's like 20 people on the roster. So the, your scouting is very specific, I think, to who you think you're going to face in the starting rotation. And then maybe you know a couple of mid-reliever guys and then maybe you know about some closers. 
we only had to know about two or three pitchers um, and we got a ton of film on those two or three pitchers. Um, and so a lot of it was us watching and interpreting on our own. Um, but if we ever did get an actual uh, report, it was a DVD, um, which I'm sure now it's not a DVD. I'm sure it's something else. <laughs> but it was a yeah. DVD that was cut for like, we could watch maybe 10 games and it was just pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch when the pitcher was no in between fluff. So you were able to see so many games that this pitcher threw. Um, you could filter it. Uh, like uh, there was a way to where I could go in and just look at lefties, how she threw to lefties, how she threw to lefty power hitters, like um, how she threw in two strike situations, three one count situations. So, you know, you could just watch it all the way through um, or you could get to the point where you were really filtering in. OK, this is exactly what I want to look for. How she throw throwers on base? Um, just things like that. Yeah. And we're going to talk today during this episode, episode 62, about how you can kind of do some a scouting and assessment when you're in high school. Not an easy thing to do because you're, and the information isn't all there. But we're mm. going to talk about that and how at least we kind of put together a scouting report as they get to college. I do want to bring up this tweet, though. This is from Alex Wood, um, left-handed pitcher at the major league level. And this is uh, pretty interesting as it relates to coaching in tech. Um, he said on Twitter this week, uh, a couple of days ago, Tech is so prevalent in all levels of baseball today, it's easy to get fooled by people pretending they know what they're talking about. Most tech is good for identifying issues. The separator is having someone with the knowledge to create a program to fix the issues, the tech IDs. And that mm. right there sort of sums up what it's like being a coach of baseball players, softball players of the year 2023, right? I mean, you're trying to balance so many things um, trying to get to know the athlete, who that athlete is as a person, as as a player, while also trying to integrate the proper tech that won't confuse them, but help them to sort of evolve and 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 as Alex puts it here, to identify those issues that that athlete may have. Uh, that's one hundred percent right, and I think uh, you know even video could be considered a form of tech that has evolved, and we've talked about this in the past where you look at video and people are so hellbent on trying to find exactly what's wrong and how this differs from a major league player when in actuality sometimes you just need to take a step back and say okay it, it, you, you're you essentially have this like puzzle you're trying to solve right and you gain information from a whoop band you gain information from blast you gain information from track man and then you have video and you have this and then you have a sit down with the athlete and you talk about this and now it's you know you're in your team of coaches jobs with that athlete to say okay what is most important for this athlete because it's not a black and you know it's not something you could put in an algorithm or shove into a computer and get a response there is a human element to it and we need to start to look and say okay is emotion driving the reason why this person is moving the way they are or they're making the decisions that they're making um because that has nothing to do with tech then right that's something completely different that you work on with the athlete um do you, you know um is the athlete moving this way because of an injury they had two or three years ago and is it worth correcting or do you just continue to help them make their strengths even better. You know, like a lot of things like that are interesting conversations to have surrounding developing a plan for an athlete or how you assess an athlete. Um, and then obviously how you utilize all this tech. Yeah. So at the end of the each year for you as a coach, checklist wise, of things and the goals you need to accomplish before the end of the year. Mm. And obviously it's a little bit different with you now, of course, your personal life, but I'm sure it's there's something very similar to it, right? Um, the checklist though is... It, adding technology or adding your your knowledge of technology, your database, your knowledge database of technology, something that you add to your checklist every year as a coach. I don't think you have to, right? Because there's new, there's new technology every year. And certainly checking it out. And I think yeah. um, I've I've gone back and forth with myself as a coach. As a young coach, I was like, man, look at all this new technology that's out there that these old school coaches want nothing to do with. And and then you know you be you you coach for five, six, seven, eight years, then you're like, okay, I get why these old school coaches maybe didn't want the technology, but I, I never want to be polarizing with any tool because meaning I either all in or all out. No, we're right. no, no one's ever going to use it because they're, again, it's a tool that might, or your knowledge about it is only going to be able to help someone else. Like you might encounter someone and you're like, you know what? I've heard of this thing. I didn't think it was going to be helpful for majority of my athletes, but with your particular thing that you're trying to focus on, this might make sense now or a scenario might comes up, or maybe that's, maybe that tool updates their software and all of a sudden 
is really valuable for you. So this way you're not starting behind the eight ball. You actually have an opportunity to be like, okay, I, I'm already downloaded on most of the stuff because I at least checked it out. Now that they added this to it, look at how much better this product can be um, or how much you know more it can help athletes. So I always like to be familiar with it. I always like to test out when I have an opportunity to, uh, but I never like to be all in, all out or black and white, I guess, if you will, on, on certain things. All right, talking today, be sure to follow us on social media at Jim Tara on both Twitter and Instagram at Coach Cassie RB on Twitter at Coach Ca- underscore Cassie RB on uh, Instagram. Be sure to follow us and email us your questions, Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. You can leave your questions on YouTube as well, our YouTube page, the Softball Strength Academy YouTube page with previous episodes and clips from previous shows as well. Be sure to subscribe, Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, wherever you get your podcast. Episode 62, Athlete Scouting and Preparation, a little bit hard to do. In high school, you don't get those physical scouting reports. There's some options you can, you know, obviously ask around. You can um, go to games yourself. But I think the key to scouting when you're in high school or scouting your opponent, the best way to do it is by watch, actually watching the game when you're on the bench mm-hmm. and gain, gaining an understanding uh, of, of what is going on in that game and who that pitcher might be who you're facing. It's different baseball and softball. You mentioned there with softball, you know, girls can pitch every day, obviously. With baseball, mm-hmm. you might do scouting reports for, I don't know how many, 10 guys, right, on, on a pitching staff, 10 or 11 guys, you might only see three to five guys that day. So it's a little bit different, but certainly the one key factor to all of this, the best way to do scouting and, and to scout your opponent as an athlete, as a baseball and softball player, is to watch the game. Mm, yes, and you know what? My coach used to always say if he was ever going to pull in a pinch hitter from the dugout, it was the person who was sitting at the front who is either charting or mentally just engaged every single time. It is so easy when you're not playing uh, or you're not starting to just kind of take a seat seat back and not be as engaged. But when you can, uh, you know, I always recommend pick one or two hitters in the lineup to try to mimic their at-bats with. So, like, maybe you're just like, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm uh, the two-hole here. And so you're prepping as if or you're in your, you're mentally prepping as if you are having an at-bat when she has an at-bat. So that's a way to stay engaged. Um, and I think having like a little checklist of questions. So um, what is the pitcher throwing first pitch strikes? Is the pitcher throwing to a side of the plate? Or do they favor throwing that their go-to strike towards the outside part of the plate, inside part of the plate? Uh, does it matter if it's a lefty or a righty? I always felt like I had a huge advantage because I, you know, pitchers throw typically very different to lefties than they do righties. And obviously when you have 10 varieties maybe that you're you're seeing it's a little easier it's a little harder to say okay she has a consistent way of throwing to righties where there's maybe one or two lefties in a light up all of a sudden i'm like okay this is she doesn't like coming inside at a lefty you know i can start to distinguish that um knowing what she likes to throw when she's ahead or when there's two strikes in the count um so those types of checklists i think are are helpful and really important i think it it aids with the uh the way a game goes where you could just be watching pitch after pitch after pitch instead you almost have like a like a, a list of questions that you're trying to answer. And I think that's really effective while you're in the actual game, waiting for your turn to to hit. Yeah. And, and when you get to the college level, if you're lucky enough, of course, to play at that level, depending on the program, um, you know, by the way, you mentioned that you back then you, you would get DVDs on the pictures you would see. I don't know if you saw this week, but Georgia is building, um, I think, an $80 million football facility. And I think in the weight room, I was reading on front office sports, they're going to have a big... Um, like a big jumbotron right in the middle of their their weight room. So I'm thinking they're probably going to be watching film of their opponents. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some programs one day will get to the point where baseball and softball will be able to watch their opponents and scout their opponents on a big jumbotron somewhere. Um, <laughs> or shoot a virtual yeah. reality setup. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But when you get to college, there's more resources. You have Mm -hmm. um, scouting reports both physically, you have them um, digitally as well. But when it came to, I'm I'm wondering with you, what were you looking for? Because there's a lot of elements to scouting reports, right? I mean, you could, you know, how, what's the pitcher throw? And this is for both baseball and softball. What does the pitcher throw? What tendencies does the pitcher have? It can be kind of overwhelming if you know what you're looking at, but you don't actually have a plan and dig in Mm -hmm. to what Mm -hmm. you want to look at, zero in on the proper information. What did you do as a national champion back in the day? Um, when you were looking at scouting reports and what did you do? What did you look at specifically that gave you the best advantage that you had 
over your opponent at that time to get prepared. You know, it's interesting because I, I feel like this took me a, a while to learn kind of uh, what worked best for me or um, how I was going to get the most out of it. Uh, but I, what I would do is, let's say I was watching a pitcher throw against uh, another uh, team. And what I would do is I'd run through the film one time and I would create little tiny strike uh, strike zones. So let's say there was 21 people she faced or more, whatever it may be. I made like 21 little little rectangles and I just went through and I marked an X in the strike zone area where she threw her strikes and I put a circle where there were balls and that was it. And I just wanted to see if I saw any pattern because typically what you'd start to end up seeing is that especially with girls who have like, oh, so-and-so has a crazy good rise ball, a crazy good drop ball. But I start to notice like, yes, they do, but they're not throwing those for strikes. And in actuality, she's hitting most of her strikes in this zone. So why am I overly concerned about this rise ball that is barely ever called a strike? I should really just be honing in on this middle inside part of the plate, right? So just little things like that were helpful. The layer one was just balls and strikes. And then I'd go through and maybe I had a different color marker and um, I was marking where she would throw her first pitch strike or her first mm-hmm. strike of the at bat. And then where she was throwing when she had two strikes on her, like, I wanted to know, like, so maybe in red was was the first strike of the event, and then in blue was, like, her strikeout pitch she was trying to go for, let's say, or her chase pitch. And so, again, I'm just trying to find a pattern or a rhythm, and I think um, that was super helpful. I would I would mark, um, sometimes I have a column on the side, what count she was throwing this off-speed pitches in. Um, that was super helpful. If I, if I knew there was a girl who was really, really confident in throwing her changeup and she could throw it at any count, that was something I had to prepare for. If there was a girl who had an off speed and she only really threw it with two strikes, that was also really valuable to know as well. It was almost something that you didn't have to worry about before, you know, you got to that situation because she wasn't confident throwing it. So um, those were, I would say, like th- those three things. Layer one, balls and strikes. Layer two, um, the first strike and the the chase pitch. And then how often she was throwing that uh, change up. And that's purely just from like watching a little bit of film. There's a whole deeper layer of like, does she change her motion on certain pitches? Does she uh, show a finger? That does she slow down? Does this, like what tells does she maybe have for to to tip her pitches? Right. Yeah. That's 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 second level advanced scouting that I think coaches at the collegiate level, especially, um, are responsible for teaching their athletes, looking for those tells. Mm-hmm. And, and looking for those cues, those tips. Um, you know, obviously, you go back to, I can't, I know, I'll never forget it, uh, for whatever reason, the World Series a couple of years ago when Lance McCullers was was tipping his pitches and the Phillies were were going all in on him. And um, there's, I mean, there were plenty of other um, examples of that. I know the Astros had a tell on Steven Strasburg years ago in 2019 mm-hmm. in that World Series and the Nationals advanced scout caught that. But part of being a great coach, I think, at the collegiate level, baseball and softball, is teaching your athletes in game, when they're scouting before the game, when they're doing that evaluation to learn what those tells are and to really study that pitcher and see if they if the pitcher's tipping anything off. Mm. And I can't tell you, actually, I could do a, a small story, but there was a, a girl named Jessica Smith. She, um, first day of practice her freshman year, tears her ACL. She takes 11 months to come back. Her first conditioning session, she steps on someone's foot and tears her second ACL, her other ACL, her very first day back. As she's rehabbing her knee stuff, she finds out she has a torn labrum in her shoulder. So she used to be a catcher. And I mean, her playing career was a a giant recovery of living in the uh, training room. And what she would do is she was like, well, I still want to contribute to my team. Mm -hmm. And she had this binder year over year where she would sit down in the dugout. No one knows. No one knows who Jessica Smith is. She never played. And she would sit there and she'd watch the catcher. And she'd watch if the catcher had like a little tip where they would lean a little bit to the left to the right. Or she'd watch the center fielder if when they went to go into their fielding stance, if they cheated a little left or right, or if they cheated back or forward, depending on the pitch. And then she'd watch the opposing pitching coach. And sometimes the opposing pitching coach would just take his hat off and wipe his forehead. And that was the sign for a changeup and she would pick it. And so when we got to the plate, like sometimes by the third inning, she's like, I think I, I know, I know the signs. I know when she's throwing a changeup. I know when she's throwing it inside. And if I was at the plate and I heard a certain keyword, I knew I was getting a changeup. And anybody who's ever hit knows how much easier it is to 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 hit when you know what's coming. So 
and that was I mean there were there were games where we had one girl in the dugout that was really looking at the grip of a pitcher another girl who was trying to look and see if um she did anything different in her windup another girl was looking at the catcher another one who was looking at the the center fielder and again you're not using technology or like uh uh like video cameras to try to pick someone's right. uh this is just right. the nature of the game and i and i think this is something that's like people are like oh I'll just go up there and hit but it's it's different like if you're not going to be careful if you're gonna if, if a catcher is gonna sh- show off that she's you know leaning towards the inside part of the plate sooner rather than later that's something that's used to your advantage yeah and again those are just that's just a simple way of, I mean, again, it goes back to what <laughs> yeah. our point was earlier. It's very, it's very simple. Watch the game, you know, yep. take notes and, and, and be able to study that way, be able to, to decipher that and accumulate that information properly. And I think the best way to do that is, again, by watching the game and doing it the right way. I, I think um, I think some people are so entertained by football or basketball or maybe just faster moving sports because you're getting constant feedback from the sport all the time. But yeah. people who like can sit down and watch a baseball game and really enjoy it, it's because they know all the in-betweens. Yes, there's maybe only action once every 30 seconds or whatever it may be, but you know, someone who actually knows the game is watching all those intricacies happen. So they are, of course, they're entertained 20 the, the whole time because they're watching what's, what's this person doing? What's that person doing? What's, what's going on over here? You know, <laughs> they're entertained right. by all the in-betweens. <laughs> yeah. There's two things I learned from Jay Gepstein. Well, I learned a lot, but there's two things that always stick out in my mind. Number one, don't suck. That's his. Um, that's one of his main sayings. Don't suck. I'm sure he's taking that with him to the University of South Carolina. Mm. And number two, watch the game. Mm-hmm. Too important now. Don't don't suck. Watch the game. I think those two are intertwined too. By the way, I, uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, you can um, get, you can get a whole lot from just watching what other people are doing. Yeah, yeah. What how, how scouting reports were back then, of course, and talking about a decade ago, when with the way scouting reports were set up for you back then, of course, you mentioned you had DVDs as well. And obviously, times have changed, especially with the high end programs. They're going to have different type scouting reports that separate them from other programs. But uh, what did you like to see in a scouting report um, that made it very easy to understand and get a picture in your head? Because that's the point of a scouting report. That's what, why scouts do what they do. They're supposed to paint a picture with their words and their evaluations. Um, I was talking, of course, professional baseball, but what did you want to see in a scouting report? How did you want it sort of lined up um, for you to to gather in all that information? So interest- interestingly enough, I don't think we actually got a piece of paper that said, here's here's the report. And I think the main reason they did that is because uh, if if technology was a little more abundant, and I think if everyone had a smartphone, I think it would just be delivered to us on our smartphone. I think they were really nervous about someone losing that piece of paper and it being found. <laughs> so there was, it was, <laughs> it was something that was always discussed. It was like a 30 to 40 minute conversation going into, it was going into your week, you had an idea of the pictures we were facing. It was like, hey, we're probably fa- we're facing a, a plus 65 70 mile an hour pitcher like just a little bit of a profile what's she what's her speed like um where does she like to who else is she like hey remember that girl we faced from georgia earlier in the year this is a very similar pitcher um what is what is our plan going to be we're going to be up in the uh, up in the box a little bit and we're going to be working on attacking the rise ball before it gets it gets up because she's throwing it for strikes right so that's like our moderate plan and then that whole week when you're hitting off the cages, when you're, you know, it, everything that we did was with a purpose with who we were prepping for that weekend, the, the three pitchers that they had, let's say. So the pitching machine was set up to be mimicking that. We would face um, our, either our scout th- thrower. So like we had managers or the pitching coach who would throw live to us, who would try to mimic that, what that pitcher threw. Um, and then going right into the weekend, it was one more meeting that was about 30 minutes that was like, okay. Let's review this. Make sure like we feel really confident and comfortable with with what our plan and what our approach is going to be. If the pitcher decides to adjust, then this is what our adjustment is going to be. So you're kind of going into the weeds of like what a chess match might be like. You know, if they if they move this way, we move, we move back that way. Um, mm-hmm. So that was that was how our scanner reports, I guess, would be. And it was really just a full blown preparation. But as far as receiving an actual piece of paper, I think that was very limited because they were just nervous of. <laughs> People losing in. 
Yeah, and as we wrap up today's episode talking about amateur um, athlete scouting in preparation, episode 62, how did, what did you do um, taking from the elements from the scouting reports that you had or the, the information that you had? How did you take that with you in game and how did you make those proper adjustments in the box? Uh, you know what? I think so much of it is visualization and so much of it is is calling on your previous um, at bats you've, you've had. So even if it's, hey, you're facing a um, 72 mile an hour lefty who throws drop curve balls, right? Like that's trying to visualize what that would look like, what that would feel like, where you want to hit that pitch. Um, and even like, you know, th- there's going to be some high schoolers and middle schoolers listening to this and being like, I go into a tournament not knowing anything about who I'm facing, what I'm facing, but you might know the color of the uniform. You might know the time of day. You might know the field you're at. And then all of a sudden, when you can start to paint those visualization pictures in your head and you can get, uh, you know, we've talked about visualization endlessly, but when you get really good at it, you can start to prep yourself mentally for what you're about to see. So I think knowing those little details, for me, at least personally, being able to visualize what I thought she was throwing, how she was throwing, um, if I knew she was throwing hard, and was going to be overpowering, how my stride might be impacted. I might be shortening up my swing just a little bit. Um, someone who's a lot slower throwing lower in the zone. That's that's a completely different adjustment for me. You know, maybe I'm a little shorter with my initial stance and I'm taking a bigger stride to meet the cadence of of where I want to be hitting that ball. So I, I guess it kind of depended, but that was a lot of things that were in my head were how's my swing going to be affected? Where am I going to stand that might be affected and how am I visualizing this? Yeah. All right. Well, good stuff this week. Um, episode 62. Next week, we'll be talking about uh, what it means to finish the journey, which is something that you did. It was at times a bumpy journey, certainly those four years at Alabama, but you came out as a national champion. We'll be talking about that. Uh, is it next? What's next week? No, next week's Thanksgiving. We don't have a new episode next week. Is it next week? after that? Yes. Yeah, I know. Right. It's crazy. There we go. Wow. Came up fast. November's going by really, really really fast you know next year 2024 the first day of the year starts on a monday that's like you know that's like it's beautiful almost perfect <laughs> type year lined up calendar wise because every you know the week starts on a sunday but nobody actually thinks in their mind that the week starts on sunday everybody thinks it's at least here in america that's the way it is so anyway that's why i think november is going by very quickly um, mm-hmm. So that'll be um, November 29th, our next episode. Um, what awesome. it means to finish the journey, episode 63. Do you have anything coming up that we need to promote going forward? We got two mental game courses. I think I talked about last time, a 20 to 30 minute one, and then a longer lecture form one and the drill library. And uh, uh, I've been getting a lot of feedback and uh, I'm I'm just thankful. It's when I put stuff out there like that, my hope is that I've, I feel like I've just been a funnel. I've been awarded so much positive information from so many different coaches, from so many different experiences. And if I can just kind of put it in a consumable way for a younger athlete, um, that's a that's a home run for me. If we would like to right. stick to our softball puns, that's that's that's, right. that's all that's all I want. So the feedback's been awesome, and I appreciate anybody who's checked it out so far. And if you haven't, you can definitely check it out with links in bio and all that. All right. Um, again, be sure to follow us on social media at Jim Tara on both platforms, Twitter and Instagram at Coach Cassie RB on Twitter at Coach Cassie on, or at Coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram. And we will talk to you in a couple of weeks.